I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Joe Gallo, one of our board members. Good afternoon, good morning, or good day, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm Joe Gallo from Active Surveillance Patients International, and I'd like to welcome you to Eat to Beat Prostate Disease. As was mentioned earlier by David, you need to be aware that the content of this event is solely for the purposes of education and information and does not constitute personal diagnostic advice or personal medical advice. I'd like to introduce our uh, the chairman of ASPI, Mark Lichty. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate uh, your um, presence. Uh, you've been a, a great source of support for ASPI. As chairman of ASPI, I want to welcome you, our sponsors, and Dr. Lee uh, to this event. Yeah. This is actually the largest uh, audience that we've had, so uh, we're we're hoping we can hold the Zoom gremlins at, at bay today. Uh, I wanted to mention to you that our nonprofit, ASPI, is here to walk with you on your prostate cancer journey. When I was first diagnosed 17 and a half years ago, I first read the China study, and that provided me great guidance in terms of the direction I would take. The China study was written by Colin Campbell, and he did an ex extensive study of a plant-based diet in China. He found that a plant-based diet uh, with a plant-based diet, the rate of cancer, prostate cancer, was far, far below the standard American diet. And when I read that book, that shifted me away from the standard American diet. Um, ASPE is unusual because we search the globe for the best information, the most current information that's gonna help you to navigate your own journey. We have no doubt that this event today will provide you that kind of information. I wanna thank Dr. David Keller for the uh, incredible leadership you provided in organizing this. And uh, no further words, David, it's your, up to you. Thank you, Mark. I am very excited to be here. We are about to share a momentous experience together. It is my honor and pleasure to tell you a little bit about our presenter, Dr. William Lee. Dr. Lee is a world-renowned physician, scientist, and speaker. He's the author of the book, Eat to Beat Disease, The New Science of How Your Body Can Heal Itself. It is a New York Times bestseller. He is the founder of the Angiogenesis Foundation. His groundbreaking work has impacted more than 70 diseases, including cancer, diabetes, blindness, heart disease, and obesity. His TED Talk, Can We Eat to Starve Cancer?, has more than 11 million views. He has appeared on Good Morning America, CNN, MSNBC, NPR, Voice of America, and he has been written up by The Atlantic Magazine, Time Magazine, and The New York Times. He has authored more than 100 scientific publications in leading journals, such as Science, The New England Journal of Medicine, and The Lancet. Dr. Lee has served on the faculties of Harvard Medical School, Tufts University, and Dartmouth Medical School, and Inc. Magazine calls Dr. Lee Richard Branson's diet guru. Clearly, Dr. Lee is a genius in the field of medicine and nutrition. And without any further delay, let's give a big international warm welcome to Dr. William Lee. Well, thank you very much, uh, David. And I want to also thank the organizers and the ASPI and sponsors for inviting me to um, share with you some of the work I've done uh, and also some of the work other people have done in the area of nutrition and cancer. And I know this is a, can be kind of a bit of a loaded uh, topic. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a framework so you know where this information is coming from. Uh, I'm a physician, internal medicine. I did my tra clinical training at Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, and be by being internal medicine, it means I take care of 
young and old, uh, healthy and sick, and men as well as women. And my goal has always been to get people back to uh, a station uh, of health. Now, when it comes to the prostate, uh, health is more or less a silent situation, meaning that uh, you don't actually have sensations in the prostate unless you actually have a problem. And I want to give you some context to why the healthy prostate actually is silent. And it seems to be very similar to many other areas of our body where when we are healthy, we don't notice it, but when we actually have a problem, it kind of stands itself out. So this is the theme I'm going to be talking about is what is health and how does that actually differentiate, distinguish between what is disease? Now, I'm not, even though I'm showing you a picture um, uh, with an apple and the, the label food is medicine, I want to let you know what I'm going to share with you today is really about what, how we're thinking about the science of health and how it relates to the science of prostate health and prostate cancer. And after that, I'm going to thread in some data on what it means for nutrition and prostate cancer, okay? So this is really the context. I'm a vascular biologist. I've had 30 years of research in the laboratory, uh, in the clinic. Uh, as David mentioned, I've been involved with drug development. So uh, I've been involved with 34 FDA approved treatments for cancer complications of diabetes, as well as vision loss. And for me, the bar is very, very high uh, for evidence. And that's really the other thing I want you guys to focus on today is really the importance of evidence. So when I say something, I want you to think about what type of evidence I'm actually presenting uh, concerning uh, my statement. All right. Well, let's move forward on this idea of food as medicine. It is not a slogan. It's not a T-shirt, a bumper sticker, and nor is it a TikTok trend. This is something that now is starting to capture the attention of, uh, of the nation, of states. This is from the uh, Massachusetts uh, state plan. Uh, the, the state government the website has a food as medicine uh, plan that's been announced. Uh, this is actually Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. This is from a, 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 a highway uh, sign, uh, cancer protection in a bag. So you can kind of see how the healthcare uh, uh, institutions, establishments are beginning to recognize the importance of nutrition in a new way that we haven't seen previously. Um, this is actually from Congress. Um, I presented at this uh, group, uh, bipartisan, the Food is Medicine Working Group. Uh, it is um, a really interesting uh, momentum that's happening in Washington that's leading in part to, uh, in September, there's going to be a second uh, 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 White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. It's the 50th anniversary, the first one that was held uh, in the White House by Richard Nixon years ago. I'm uh, on a task force um, advising uh, the, that uh, program as well. And again, there's a lot going on, and uh, not only in Washington, but here, this is actually from a program that I actually spoke at and was helped to organize at the Vatican, where um, the Vatican leadership organized a health conference um, if you can believe it, in which diet and nutrition and culture was actually brought together in terms of improving the lives of our community and our and our society. So how is diet important to humanity? How does science intersect with that? So I share all this with you really as a preamble to basically say that what I'm telling you is not is is a tip of the iceberg, but I'm not the only person. There's actually a lot of momentum going on uh, in this. Uh, um, so, you know, we've had about 10 years of pretty convincing research that's been published in the peer-reviewed literature that what we eat matters when it comes to our prostate health. Uh, this is a study that was published from the Harvard School of Public Health in the International uh, Journal of Cancer, looking at the connection between fruits and vegetables um, uh, and prostate cancer. There were some signs, I mean, there were some signs earlier than this, but look, I mean, this actually showed um, that uh, men who are eating cruciferous vegetables, this is an association study, when they actually took large populations of, of men uh, and asked them what they ate and then correlated their uh, health outcomes, they actually found a statistically significant 59% reduction in the risk of prostate cancer progression. So this isn't prevention of prostate cancer, this is preventing prostate cancer from going on. All right, so when you see this, 
you know, you can get a news headline that says, you know, broccoli um, uh, fights prostate cancer. It's more complicated than that. This is actually a discovery that puts a hypothesis up that says that something that we're doing might be beneficial for men with prostate cancer. In fact, perhaps preventing the prostate cancer from progressing. Now, researchers need to dive in there and try to figure out why, how much, what is the correlation? Is it safe? There's a lot of other questions that are out there. One of the, um, I would say, shortcomings of nutrition is although it's really powerful uh, in terms of its science and the impact on, on, on human health, it's also a real temptation for editors in the media to run a headline column that, every, that makes everybody jump up, uh, maybe jump up for joy. And then the next week they run the counter uh, headline that then basically causes whiplash and confusion. So the way to get beyond that is really to be able to look at the types of studies that are presenting. That's why I'm telling you, this is an association study. It's meaningful, it's interesting, and it's important because of the magnitude and the statistical connection between eating cruciferous vegetables, cauliflower, bro broccoli, uh, bro Brussels sprouts, kale, mustard greens, chard, uh, with a reduction in the progression of prostate cancer. Now, this is also interesting. Uh, they were citing other studies that looked at the um, reduction by 40% of incident extra prostatic prostate cancer. What, what the heck does that mean? Well, prostate cancer is in the prostate, starts in the prostate. Extra prostatic um, prostate cancer is really code for metastatic disease. So this is actually when the tumor actually um, escapes um, the prostate capsule. All right, interesting. Uh, very, very in, in, intriguing. And this is from 10 years ago. So what I'm going to do now is actually take you forward sort of from uh, the past in, towards present day and then point you to the future of what we're thinking about when it comes to uh, health, specifically the prostate um, and also uh, nutrition. Now, this is really important because I'm sure all of you uh, who are watching this have um, had a conversation with your doctor, your urologist, your medical oncologist, perhaps, um, or your primary care, your GP, um, uh, having this conversation, if I have prostate cancer, uh, what do I do? Okay, how bad is it? How long do I have? What are my treatment options? Is it surgery, radiation? Is it watchful waiting, active surveillance? Um, do I get into a clinical trial? Are there immunotherapies that are available for me? You know, run the litany, the, the, the checkbox of all the things that everyone should be asking their doctor. And I used to be one of these doctors on the other side, you know, talking to my patients, men who actually were had elevated PSAs. I would send them for an ultrasound. Uh, a, a referral, and they would come back, you know, with a diagnosis, they've got a mass in their prostate. And we'd have this long conversation, which would almost always end with one question, which is, hey, doc, thanks for your time. Um, I got to digest all this, a lot to think about. But I do have one other question. What can I do for myself? Is there something I should be eating? And this was about 20 years ago, where I was, I didn't have the answer to that. And I realized that I had all this education, you know, and I've been involved in drug development. And that one simple thing of doc, what should I eat? I, I had never been really educated about nutrition. And I felt that was wrong. And that's what led me as somebody who's been involved with biotechnology, deep laboratory, test tube, molecular research, to go back to try to figure the question out. So what should people who are uh, struggling with uh, the dilemma of how, what they can do for themselves with uh, when it comes to nutrition and cancer, what are the answers to this? So that's really what I'm gonna be presenting to you um, today. All right, well, I wanna just step back for one moment to say the answers that the focus that you, that most men uh, have with their doctors really is all about the treatment. It's about the chemo, the hormonal therapy, the surgery, the radiation, right? This idea that, you know, um, doctors are really, fluent in talking about the heat seeking missile the chemotherapy the you know the 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 destructive uh, therapy for uh, against prostate and other cancers doesn't matter if it's liver cancer colon cancer lung cancer brain tumors you know we as doctors as a medical as medical professionals we're trained to be very fluent in the language of chemotherapy cytotoxic therapies and by the way 
chemotherapy is actually in the historically speaking, not that old. I mean, it's, 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 um, you know, not even a hundred years old chemotherapy as we know it today started in the 1940s, um, really after world war II. Um, I don't know if you guys know the history of chemotherapy, but there was a, um, a, uh, allied ship that was secretly and illegally carrying chemical weapons, mustard gas, uh, that was had snuck into um, Italy in the Bay of Bari, Italy, uh, and it was not supposed to be there. And it was disguised as a res- Red Cross ship, and the idea was to unleash chemical warfare against um, uh, the Germans. And it was obviously not something that should have been done after World War One. We actually had these conventions not to do that, but there was a leak, and the and the bo- ship was bombed by the enemies and it leaked mustard gas everywhere. It killed a lot of civilians, okay? It's a stain on sort of the allies to try to do this sneaky little thing. But one of the, that's how chemotherapy was discovered because the mustard gas that leaked out killed a lot of people. But ironically, some of the cancer patients in the hospitals survived. They survived not just the mustard gas, they, you know, the chemical, uh, uh, the, the collateral damage of the chemical leaking out, they survived their cancer. That, for you guys that you may not know, is the history, the, the birth uh, uh, of chemotherapy. There's a lo- big history to this if you actually want, are interested in it. But I want to tell you that like, they're, they're, I, I'm somebody who really believes in understanding our present and future. It's really, really helpful to take a look at how history delivered uh, what, we're, what we're familiar with today. So that's the 1940s, all right? We are now in the um, 21st century in 2022, going into 2023, and we don't think about the cancer cell alone anymore, okay? Nor do we think about, you know, launching missiles uh, to try to, you know, destroy like wartime mindset against cancer. We realize that cancer doesn't live alone. In fact, cancer cells live with a huge jumble of a microenvironment, a chaos that actually happens around the cancer cells, involves their blood vessels, involves um, connective tissue like collagen, involves inflammation, uh, inflammatory cells and immune cells. It involves connective tissue, it involves molecular receptors. And again, if you were to light all this up, here you can see, here's the chemotherapy, here's the targeted anti-angiogenic therapy, here's the immunotherapy, and here's the hormonal therapy and these blue arrows I'm actually showing you. All right, so we're no longer just thinking simplistically, you know, must kill cancer, must hit them with poison. We're now beginning to have a more sophisticated approach. And I'm going to actually share with you a little bit about the immune uh, therapy part of it, because I think that this is one of the areas, as somebody who's a cancer researcher, who's been involved in drug development, that every man um, who is thinking about prostate cancer needs to be aware of and keep your eye on the ball, uh, because it's one of the most promising areas. Okay. So we're not talking about throwing babies out with the bathwater. We're talking about keeping um, our growing understanding of how complex cancer is and all the different ways that we can try to tackle it. And hopefully um, uh, with less harm to the patient and more benefit uh, to overall health. Now, having said that, what is it that when you're talking about active surveillance, we're um, doing? Well, we're, we're keeping an eye on this crazy microenvironment that uh, uh, that you're looking at in the center of your screen here, all right? Is there a way that we can get this microenvironment to be not chaotic, to be more organized? You know, can we get people who are going to the Broadway theater and, you know, having a party, can we get them to quiet down, uh, put away their uh, beverages and walk into the theater and sit down uh, quietly to watch the show? That's really one of the areas that nutrition uh, comes into play because the body doesn't, uh, uh, sorry, the, the therapeutics actually um, pharmacologically uh, manhandles uh, literally the, the, chaos, the chaos. It's kind of like security guards, you know, the big guys dressed in black coming in, wrestling the, the, the Broadway, the chaotic Broadway audience back uh, and putting, forcing them in their seats or kicking them out of the theater. The body, when you feed it, actually tries to take a kinder, gentler approach to get everybody, coax them into the theater and coax them to sit down and to quiet down, all right? They're not mutually exclusive. They actually can work together. But what we're doing now is moving away solely from bringing the security forces in 
And we're also trying to figure out how do we actually take a kinder, gentler approach and allow the body to actually participate in getting this chaos to be settled again. All right. Now, let me also tell you something that is really striking, that is changing our vision, our understanding of cancer, which is that I know many of you watching this um, have prostate cancer, had prostate cancer, um, are trying to uh, think about cancers. Well, look, if you are a man and you uh, have prostate cancer, guess what? I have some news for you. The biology that we know about cancer, and I'll tell you this is a cancer research, is that whether you're young or old, even children, we all have microscopic cancer in our bodies all the time, all the time, from the time we're children, teenagers, young adults, 20-year-olds, 80-year-olds, uh, uh, we all have cancer. And I'll tell you how we know this. And I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to show you exactly the, the, the numbers. So that I'm going to show you the accounting on this. But autopsy studies uh, have been done in, uh, in people of different age of sexes and age brackets. And they found that uh, although people may not be diagnosed with cancer, there's these tiny little microscopic ditzels about the size of the tip of the ballpoint pen that are cancer that are actually studying our bodies anyway, silently, even when we feel like we're healthy without a PSA or CEA or any cancer markers going up and they're like pimples in our body. How do I know this? Well, an autopsy study of women between the ages of 40 and 50, these are women who died of car accidents or trauma or suicide. When they did autopsy studies, they found that 40% of women between the ages of 40 and 50 already had microscopic cancers in their breast. When they did it for men between the ages of 50 and 60, car accidents, suicide, trauma, accidents, they found that 50% of men already had microscopic cancers in their prostate. Asymptomatic, not clinical, cancer without any form of disease. When they looked at men between, uh, between 70 and 80, okay, older than 70, they actually found that almost 100% of men have these microscopic thyroid cancers that will never become a problem for them, all right? Now, this idea of cancer without disease is radical because you know when we hear the word cancer, a shiver goes down our spine. It is one of those terms that when you have a conversation about it, it makes you feel nauseated, right? Like even as a doctor, I can tell you when I have a patient who, you know, like is newly diagnosed with a scan with, you know, a, a, with the, the, the form, the results come back with cancer, I, I feel I have the sinking feeling because that's how society has trained us to think about it. But I wanna encourage you to think about this new biology that we've all got cancer in our body, everywhere. They're like little pimples. They're harmless, but they never, most of them will never cause disease. This is really important because it means that we can live with that, with cancer in our body without any um, threat of disease. Now, how do we do this? Uh, how do we do it better? So I'm going to tell you the math now. The human body contains 39 trillion cells. This is an estimate, but, a, but the best estimate we have right now, normal healthy cells. This could be your skin cells, your liver cells, your heart cells, your brain cell, your prostate cells, 39 trillion of them, and they have to replicate, uh, they have to divide, okay? That's why you're still here tomorrow, because yesterday there was cell division, and then tomorrow there's going to be more cell division. 39 trillion cells have to copy and paste themselves exactly for us to stay around, okay? Now, think about the challenge of copy and pasting um, cells, healthy cells. If I gave you 10 words on a laptop, to copy in a Word document, you would do it exactly correct, okay? If I gave you 100, probably, most of you will probably also do a pretty good job getting, you know, you probably scored 99. You might get one word wrong. If I gave you 39 trillion cells to copy and paste, I guarantee you, you would make a mistake. And the body does the same thing, all right? For, for 39 trillion cells, every 24 hours, the copy-paste mechanisms, okay, guess how many mistakes are made every single day? That's right, every day, our cells, when copying themselves, make 10,000 DNA mistakes every 24 hours, okay? That's basically why we have these microscopic cancers. Every single one of these errors can lead to a mutation that leads to an abnormal cell. It could be anywhere. It could be in your small intestines, could be in your skin, could be in your muscle, could be your heart, could be your eyeball. They're, they're abnormal cells, and it takes just a couple of these hits to turn them into little cancers, okay? This is, by the way, how prostate cancer starts as well. And then what happens is that they sit there like pimples 
If I showed you a pimple on your face and you looked in the mirror, you would focus on it. But if I if a pimple formed on your on your back and you couldn't see it in the mirror, you might ignore it. And guess what? Most of those pimples go away, just like this. Most of the microscopic cancers in our body disappear by themselves. How does it do that? You know, like all of us who do, you know, are dealing with cancer in one way or, or another, um, especially cancer patients, they always say, well, why me? Why did I get cancer? I'm just telling you as a researcher, I'm asking a slightly different question that I think is going to lead to major progress forward. And that question is, why don't we get cancer more often? Okay, why didn't you get cancer when you were 20, 30? Because if we could figure that out, then we can apply that knowledge to help to tackle uh, people with cancer so we can kind of turn the clock back to reverse it. Now, look, this 10,000 DNA mistakes, these errors, they form these little pimples. This is, what, this is a, a, a cartoon I'm showing you of what a microscopic cancer in the prostate would look like. Look at it. It doesn't have a blood supply. Without a blood supply, an organ, a cell cannot grow. And so these tiny little mutated prostate cancer cells could be breast, could be brain, could be liver, could be colon. They can only grow to the size of the tip of a ballpoint pen, and then they run out of air, okay? They, they don't have more oxygen. They can't get nutrients, all right? When, whatever you're eating, they can't get the benefit from it, and they are cut off from uh, the circulation. Now, this is how the body, one of the ways the body prevents uh, cancers from growing up, these microscopic cancers. It actually prevents uh, uh, blood vessels from feeding cancers, anti-angiogenic, no circulation, no tumor growth. And so then these little microscopic cancers sit there harmlessly. They can't do anything. It's kind of like a, a, a drug dealer that's coming into a nice neighborhood, sitting on a street corner. There's no buyers. Okay. He's run out of his suppliers. Uh, can't get, they, can't, they can't get into the nice neighborhood. Now what happens? Then the immune system swings by, conducts surveillance, like cops in a neighborhood doing cops on a beat, patrolling the neighborhood. They see this drug dealer, this microscopic cancer sitting in a corner by him or herself, shouldn't be there. The immune system picks up the cancer, takes it away, destroys it. That's immune destruction. This is what's happening in our body every single day. Our cells are dividing, errors are made, microscopic cancers are formed. Our body puts up a defense to prevent blood vessels from feeding them so they can't grow large. And then our immune system wings by, conducts surveillance and tackles them and, and eliminates them, takes them out with the trash, all right? This is the new biological view of cancer. And this is what's happening when you don't get cancer, clinical cancer. Now, remember I showed you that picture of all the chaos? Remember I talked to you about the, the Broadway audience is going nuts and having a riot inside the theater? All right, so somewhere between this and that chaotic picture I showed you earlier is where most people are. Most people are in terms of the cancer journey. So how do we actually get this kind of a situation, a quiet situation back again? So a little bit more about angiogenesis, because that's actually what I do study. That little tiny um, harmless dot on, on the upper left-hand corner, when those cancer cells are able to hijack angiogenesis and cause force the body to grow blood vessels to them, they do it by releasing fertilizers. The blood vessels grow towards the fertilizer. Once the blood vessels touch the cancer and start bringing in oxygen and nutrients, these tumors can grow 16,000 times in size in just two weeks. So if you want to tackle cancer and reverse it, one way that we're looking at this is by starving the cancer by cutting off its blood supply. This is called anti-angiogenic. There's more than 12 anti-angiogenic drugs that have been FDA approved. I've been involved with every single one of them. Um, it's a really, really interesting uh, approach. Uh, and as I'm going to show you, not they're not only drugs, but they're foods specifically related to prostate cancer that can actually help the body do something similar. All right. Now, this is actually um, a, a experiment that I helped to set up at the National Cancer Institute. This is many years ago. On the left-hand side, you're looking at this dark ring. Okay, this is through the lens of a microscope. So those of you who are not researchers, I'm sharing with you kind of like a behind the scenes view of what a researcher sees. What you're looking at is an, is an eagle's eye view on the left of a ring. This is the ring, it's an aorta. It's actually the cross section of the largest blood vessel in the body. And this is from a, a lab animal, a rat. And when you cut um, a, a, the largest straight blood vessel into one millimeter slices and look at them from the top, eagle's eye view, these are like little calamari rings you're looking from the top. Those little white threads 
are blood vessels that used to be in the center of the ring. And now when you drop so what tumors release, look at how they nicely kind of starburst out. They grow out because they're trying to feed the cancer. Now, TNP-470 is a natural drug, came from a fungus. Uh, I was involved with the discovery team. We did some of the early experiments. When you drop that anti-angiogenic, cancer-starving, blood vessel-stopping drug into the same system, look on the right-hand side. Bam, you've knocked out all the blood vessels. Now, uh, whatever the tumor for, tries to put out, it, you're, you're countering uh, that what the tumor is trying to do by preventing blood vessels from feeding it. That's called anti-angiogenic therapy. And this is one of the first patients that received that. This is a, a young woman, a 34-year-old 34 woman with metastatic cervical cancer. And just so you know, I'm just going to disclose, I'm going to talk about a lot of different cancers because the principles I'm telling you apply to prostate cancers as well. I'm obviously going to talk about prostate cancer. So what you're looking at on the left-hand side is a CT scan. Okay, um, this is the cross section, and you're looking at those black kind of um, uh, half moons are the air in the lung that uh, round oval in the center is her heart. You can see at the top, um, th those are her breast implants. So you're looking sort of from her feet upwards, and you're looking at that. And now look at the little white areas that are in the um, uh, in the black fields right here, what I'm showing with my cursor. That's metastatic cancer. That's from the cervix. You give her this natural angiogenesis inhibitor, TMP470, over 18 weeks, it's the only thing she got, no chemo, cut off the blood supply and look at the result. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine as a first case of metastatic cancer that's been tackled with an angiogenesis inhibitor. This is in the early days, 1998. We've come a long way since then, but it's something that I'm showing you setting the stage to understand other research. So our body's ability to protect itself against cancer involves angiogenesis to prevent blood vessels from growing, but we want good blood vessels from growing. It, uh, it, it does a lot. Our body defends us against cancer in a lot of other ways. DNA modification. We get those mutations. We fix those mutations. We can knock out mutations by um, having uh, uh, antioxidants, antioxidation. We can fix our DNA. We can also use uh, 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 DNA modifications uh, uh, through uh, uh, diet uh, and lifestyle can also very important. Our body also protects us against cancer by regeneration. If you get chemo or hormonal therapy or radiation therapy, your body will regenerate any damaged healthy tissues using stem cells to build them back up. I'm going to come back to the stem cells in a second. Microbiome. All of you probably have heard of the gut microbiome by now. It's gut health. When I, was a, when I was in medical school, I was taught that bacteria are bad. Well, the gut microbiome is all gut bacteria. It's 40 trillion bacteria in our gut, all right? It turns out that most of the bacteria in our body are good. There's a few bad bacteria, um, but what we're just beginning to understand now is just how important good, healthy bacteria in our gut are. By the way, this 40 trillion bacteria means that we are about one-to-one -one ratio of human cells and bacteria cells. That tells you how important it actually is. And the food that we eat, by the way, after feeding our human cells, go on to feed our bacteria. So think about this. If you had a pet cat or a dog or a fish or a bird, right? Or some other exotic animal, um, think about it. You are gonna be mindful every day to feed your pet. You know, put, it into the, put the kibble into the bowl, make sure they're well fed. Now, the same thing is happening with our gut bacteria, realizing that we, every time we eat three times a day, we are feeding our human cells, the 39 trillion human cells, and we're feeding about the same number of bacteria. When we feed ourselves good quality food, our healthy cells are good and our gut bacteria are good. When we feed ourselves unhealthy foods, okay, what's happening is we're also poisoning our gut bacteria, one of our body's health defense systems. Gut bacteria help to lower inflammation, improve this healthy bacteria, improve our metabolism, counter cancer, jack up our immune system, which I'm going to share with you. Um, so very, very important to protect that health defense system. And then our immune system, look, after the last two and a half years, everyone knows how important immunity is against invaders from outside, viruses and bacteria. Okay. We need to, you know, def defend against that stuff. But guess what? Our immune system is a defender against invaders from inside our body. Remember I told you the cop on the beat patrolling the neighborhood, seeing the drug dealer sitting on the corner of a good neighborhood, microscopic cancers. That is why we need a good, healthy immune system as well. 
it's not just against whatever is out there in the big bad world of aerosolized bugs or, or you know dirt that we might see uh, dirty uh, contaminated tissue we're talking about inside we need a good strong immune system and guess what so this is actually a brand new way of thinking about health health is not just the absence of disease being cancer free is not just the absence of cancer it is these systems that are firing in all cylinders protecting us from cancer being able to grow and other diseases being able to take root very, very important because each of these systems, by the way, there are drug companies that are developing all kinds of fancy things, anti-angiogenic therapy, gene therapy, stem cell therapy, microbiomic therapy, immunotherapy. But the one thing that we can all effect ourselves to help our own body's hardwired systems, so what I'm showing you here, is the food that we eat can either take down these systems and destroy them. It's lowering our shields, making ourselves more vulnerable. Or, and this is the good news, we can eat foods that raise our shields and protect us against cancer and other diseases as well. Okay, so let's talk about what those some of those foods actually are. Uh, let's see, my screen is, I'm going to go forward here. All right, so think about these health defenses like a fortress. All right, this is from a, an, Eng an English castle um, uh, in the south of England. And you can kind of see um, there's turrets, there's slits that you can shoot arrows out of. Um, there's a slope, there's a moat, there's a slope wall. Many of you may not know this, but the way that castles were built when you enter their main thing, besides a drawbridge, which is another defense, is there's when you walk into the foyer of a castle, there's a big hole in the roof. You may not have looked up to see it when you visited a castle. I don't know if the Disney castle has it, but real castles do. That was called a murder hole. OK, and it was designed by architects so that if invaders made it over the moat on the drawbridge uh, through the door, they could drop hot oil or drop a boulder through the top to actually knock out the enemy invading. So think of your body as a body fortress with all these health defenses protecting us in lots of different ways. OK, now food is one way to activate our health defenses to make our fortress or those defenses work even better. And this is not a new concept. Uh, although I'm going to tell you, show you new data, this is a very, very old concept. So attributed to Hippocrates, he said, let food be thy medicine. Now, this is just an attribution. I, I worked with Greek scholars and I could never find an actual quote. But back then, and we're talking about 2000 years ago, we didn't have pharmaceuticals. We didn't have chemotherapy. We didn't have hormonal therapy. They didn't have any kind of re reliable surgery, okay, to get at the prostate. I will tell you, the only thing they actually had was the food and uh, uh, around them. Uh, and that's what they really believed in. They believed there was actually benefit, which of course there actually is. So 2000 years later, let me actually show you where we're at now. Because one of the things that we have 2000 years later than Hippocrates is we have the ability to get the evidence. So some of you watching this, and I know that even for the board of ASPI, you know, that came up before in pre preparing my presentation, they're like, you know, Dr. Lee, please don't show anything that's going to mislead people and, and set false expectations and raise this, you know, wave a, a frond of kale and make people go crazy over it. And so I'm a scientist. I told you the bar is very high. So now I'm going to present to you the evidence and how do we get at the evidence to know that the diet that we have can actually impact our health. So I want to tell you this kind of this light bulb moment that actually has existed um, uh, that lets us know that that, that actually can that uh, that uh, that food can actually make a difference. So the first thing that's a, maybe of a surprise to you is that our ability to understand food as medicine comes from drug development. All right, I've been involved with this. So as of this summer, there there have been over the last twenty five years. 948, almost a thousand drugs that the FDA has approved. You cannot get a drug approved without lots of preclinical data, lots of clinical data, lots of good clinical trial design and, um, uh, uh, and statistics, all right? Lots of evidence for safety and effectiveness. What that means is that every scientist who's involved with this field, and these are just some of the treatments I've been involved with uh, over the last uh, 30 years or so, um, every scientist will know that you have to get lots of different kinds of evidence to be able to build a case. Now, here are some drugs that were approved by FDA just in 2021. Here are some that are slated for approval this year, some of them already approved. This is an ongoing thing. And what I want to communicate to you is that to get these approved, 
You need to know that behind the scenes, you guys don't need to know anything about this. Um, you were watching this, but I want to tell you as a scientist, there is a ton of very, very complex research going. This is the human kind of, we use this information to know how the human body works. This is actually pathways in the body that can drive cancer cells or healthy cells. These are other cell pathways we mapped out. It's an alphabet soup to the civilian who isn't, actually most doctors won't even know how to interpret this. But if you're a medical scientist like me, this is actually my wheelhouse. I know how to actually work with this alphabet. And then we're looking about cell therapies. And so how cells actually can communicate as well. This is how drugs are being approved today. So here is actually how it connects back to nutrition because the same pathways uh, can be activated in human cells, cancer cells, like you see on the right-hand side, by plants, by what's in plants. Mother Nature has put all kinds of natural chemicals in plants that when we eat them, get into our bloodstream, okay? This is the food is medicine concept. And you know, we used to think that the nutritionists used to teach us macro uh, uh, nutrients, you know, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, sugars, you know, uh, all those kinds of calories. The new science of nutrition looks at the bioactives, the chemicals that are found in cruciferous vegetables, broccolis, cauliflowers, peaches, uh, 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 garlic, uh, strawberries, all these things. We're beginning to actually figure out what they are. And when we eat them, they get into our bloodstream at digestive doses, and they act on cells as well. And we can use that knowledge I shared with you uh, from, on, uh, from the FDA to actually tackle this. So let me just show you an experiment I did. I call this farm versus pharma, and this is the studying angiogenesis. So if you take a look at that big black bar at the top, that's 100% blood vessel growth, the way that cancers would try to recruit blood vessels to feed themselves. And because I was doing this at the National Cancer Institute, we were able to throw in cancer drugs or other drugs in there. And you can kind of see if you screen drugs, you'll see cancer drugs have a pretty powerful uh, effect in knocking down the blood vessels. But because I was actually doing the research, and I mentioned to you, I felt it was wrong that I knew nothing about nutrition. I, I had maybe a week uh, worth of nutrition when I was in medical school. That it's, it's a crime, actually. Um, I actually went back and, uh, and started to study this. So unbeknownst to my uh, uh, can other cancer researchers, I took um, chemicals that were isolated from foods and I threw them into the same system. Okay, this is food head-to-head uh, -head against medicine. Check it out. This is what I found. It's really quite amazing. You can test stuff, the molecules from food, extracts from food, side by side, head to head against drugs to see what they do against one of these biological drivers of cancer. Now, let's just dive in and take a look at the evidence. So I'm going to start with soybeans because um, uh, there's a lot of evidence for that. So remember this tool I showed you? This is actually the ring the calamari ring looking at the top, the eagle's eye view, and all those little white threads or the blood vessels growing out, sparked uh, as if by cancer. And so remember I showed you that other treatment, TMP-470, shut it down as anti-androgenesis. Check it out. Take an isolate from soy. You really shut down these blood vessels, right? So now wait a minute. Some of you may say, I, I know that soy is not good for you because it's got hormones. It's got phytoestrogens. Uh, that's got to be bad. That's what you hear about sort of on the internet and through the chat rooms. Well, I can tell you as a scientist, I looked into this. This is what the soy estrogen looks like. Just, you don't have to be a chemist. Just take a look at it. This is what human estrogen looks like. Does it look identical? Absolutely not. They're different molecules. In fact, the soy phytoestrogen, the phyto plant estrogen actually blocks human estrogen. It is mother nature's tamoxifen. All right. So women, they're told they should avoid soy because they have breast cancer or they're afraid of breast cancer, or high risk of breast cancer. Totally wrong. Okay. That's an urban legend. I want to uh, call it out right now and smash that uh, false uh, idea. And how do we know this is true? Because they're, it's just not even the same molecule. Because the studies have been done in the clinic. This is a study of 5,042 women who are at the highest risk for breast cancer. What does that mean? That means they already have breast cancer. And this is from the Shanghai Breast Cancer Survival Study. And what they found is that those women who ate more soy products in their food had a almost 30% reduction in death, not increase, a reduction. And for those women who had surgery and they were in remission, they had a 32% lower recurrence if they ate more soy, 
not less soy. If you go to Asia, you don't hear any of this foolishness of like, don't eat soy products. In Asia, women who actually have breast cancer, they go on eating their soy, they, their soy products. So it's actually a, a, a source protein. Now, how much do you need to eat of the soy? About 10 grams a day in, in this study of soy protein. That's the amount of soy protein you get in a tall glass of soy milk. So readily achievable, like realistic. This isn't like buy your soy supplement online. This is a study, again, association study, but really where the stakes are high and looking at this correlation. Okay. Now, some people who are skeptics will say, well, Dr. Lee, you just cherry picked one study and you showed that nice try. Um, uh, uh, anybody can pull that magic trick. Look, this is 14 studies um, uh, looking at breast cancer and soy uh, and uh, death versus survival. And in every single one of these 14 studies, uh, the results have shown eating soy improves survival and in zero cases has, does it increase death. All right. So again, another type of evidence. When you talk about food, you can't just rely on the FDA and the drug company to come up with the information. You can't even rely on only the oncologists who are just now starting to get into the field of play when it comes to nutrition. All right. So, you know, I would say arguably the medical community is the last to get on board on this, which is why when you talk to your doctor, um, a more conventionally trained doctor or an old fashioned doctor about nutrition, they just haven't had the education. Just like I told you, I didn't. I had to earn this by actually diving into the deep end of the pool for nutrition. And what about prostate cancer? Turns out that soy, which I showed you is anti-angiogenic, cuts off the blood supply of tumors, which is important for prostate cancer as well, has also been studied for this correlation prostate cancer. This is actually a, a meta-analysis, again, kind of this composite review um, from the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. So again, these are studies that are being done by serious academic researchers published in peer-reviewed journals, all right, with critical people looking at the data. And this is actually looking at um, a, a number of different studies, uh, 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 16 studies all together. And again, you can kind of see uh, uh, on the, the line uh, in the middle of one, that's um, you know basically no change in risk. On the right-hand side would be more risk of prostate cancer. On the left-hand side would be less risk of prostate cancer. And you can kind of see pretty convincingly all these studies of soy and prostate cancer, the more soy you eat, the slight, but importantly, composite shift to the left of reducing the risk of prostate cancer. And the relative risk, the RR you see on the right-hand side, that is out of 1.0, 100%, the decrease in the risk that was found um, by all these studies. Okay. So that's a really, really important uh, uh, finding that relates to cancer in general by tackling one of the body's health defense systems to really try to get, um, uh, 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 to get improvement. Now, tomatoes have been well known to um, be beneficial for prostate cancer. I want to give you a little bit of sort of my take on it. Uh, there's an urban legend right now that tomatoes are nightshades along with eggplants. Stay away from nightshades. It contain anti-nutrients. Totally bunk. All right. It's another urban legend. Somebody well-intentioned came up with it, spread it on the internet, just not true, all right? Tomatoes improve survival for cancer patients. Um, that's been studied in these association studies. And the bioactive, the natural chemical is lycopene. There's, th there's thousands of these uh, natural molecules. We barely studied them, but lycopene is one of them. Lycopene is found in the, in the skin and in the flesh of a tomato. And guess what? Studies have shown that lycopene will actually... Um, inhibit the angiogenesis that those, those bright uh, threads I showed you in that exact same aortic ring assay, putting lycopene from a tomato into the system inhibits angiogenesis, cuts off the blood supply uh, the same way that I showed you for these other diseases as well. This is actually how food as medicine research is done. You notice something in the clinic, you go or population studies, you go back and study it in the humans, you run a clinical trial, you go back into the lab, you study it in an isolated system, it is, it, this is what's going on right now. It's, it's, it's like serious, it's serious business. And here's a study from the National Cancer Institute that showed um, from Ed Giamucci from Harvard and from the health professional study, they showed that consuming two or more servings of cooked tomatoes was associated with a reduced risk of developing prostate cancer by about 30%. Now, why is that? Because the lycopene in a tomato, when you pick a tomato like an apple from a vine and you eat it or you cut up into a salad, Raw tomato tastes great. Great source of vitamin C. Great source of of uh, of, of, of it's a great source of hydration. I love um, uh, fresh tomatoes. The lycopene is not that bioavailable. Okay, only about twenty percent of the tomato of raw tomato of lycopene is available. But if you heat that tomato 
okay, and simmer it. Low heat will actually convert that chemical structure of lycopene into a form your body will absorb 80% of it. And because lycopene is fat soluble, the best way to um, heat it up is with oil. What kind of oil? Olive oil. Now you've got tomatoes and olive oil and simmering, and now you've got tomato sauce. Now you've got the Mediterranean diet. This is really how we're beginning to make sense of the science and see how it plays a role. In fact, in this study, they actually took some of the patients and they found those men who did develop prostate cancer, like only third, about 30% didn't, those who did, they biopsied the cancer tissue, the, the, the cancer, and they looked at blood vessels, uh, how much how much angiogenesis there was within the tumor. The more blood vessels, the more aggressive the tumor. And then they correlated it with the amount of tomato sauce that the patients were eating. And the more tomato sauce they ate every month, the less blood vessels were in the tumor and the less aggressive the prostate cancer. So this isn't just an association. This is actually pathology going and correlating something, the, the food frequency that people are eating along with the actual under the microscope pathology. Very sophisticated study um, done by Lorelei Mucci. Okay, and this is what I was just telling you. Uh, there's even science looking at how long you prepare it. You take a tomato, um, you simmer it 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, uh, you'll, you'll shift the 50% of the chemicals uh, in two minutes you'll amplify the uh, uh, amount of absorbable lycopene by 250%. You concentrate it within uh, the volume if you simmer it for 30 minutes. So this is like grandma's slow simmering sauce. It's really amazing to think about like, you know, I, a lot of people are looking at fake meat. I'm looking at this kind of stuff because it's much more interesting to, I think can be beneficial uh, to, to men. The other thing that we're looking at, by the way, is not all tomatoes are equal. So what tomatoes have the highest levels of lycopene? You know, in the summertime, when I go out to the farmer's market or the grocery store, I'm overwhelmed with the amount of, is it a heirloom tomato? Is that a Roma tomato? What, you know, what do I want to get? I'll tell you what I get when, I, when I'm thinking about my prostate. I happen to know that these four tomatoes are very high in lycopene. San Marzano tomato from Italy, not just the fresh ones, even the canned ones or even the paste. Cherry tomatoes have the same amount of, of lycopene as a regular big tomato concentrated in a smaller package. The tangerine tomato, you don't need to cook it. It already has the lycopene already transformed. And the black tomato, this uh, these dark tomatoes actually already have um, a ton of lycopene uh, and other bioactives that are in it as well. So this is what I choose when I go to, to look at it. Now, this has also been um, uh, described uh, looking at lycopene and angiogenesis and prostate cancer. Uh, uh, this was also in the journal of the National Cancer Institute. And look, higher lycopene intake inversely related with total prostate cancer. Now, how do you, what, do you, what can you do with this information? You can actually say, well, what other foods have lycopene? Papaya has lycopene. Watermelon has lycopene. In fact, watermelon has more lycopene than, um, uh, than a tomato, all right? So uh, it's really interesting to think about how to use this information. Um, it's not like being a robot and saying, well, so what should I eat? It's what is the science showing us about the foods that we normally eat? So am I actually recommending that you eat, guys eat tomatoes I'd say, you know what? Eat tomatoes if you love tomatoes, but you should know that the research is showing that there's evidence that cooked tomatoes actually have the ability to impact a biological system that impacts on prostate cancer. And what's the other reason that I'm telling you to eat tomatoes is because you just might like to eat foods that are cooked with tomatoes. And that's probably the most important part I wanna leave you with is that eat foods that are good for you that also bring you pleasure. Love your food to love your health. This is the real reason to be able to do it. And tomatoes are not harmful to you. That's the other thing I want to leave you with. All right. Lots of foods with anti-angiogenic activity. Um, if you want to actually read about them in my book, you can. it's available anywhere books are sold. You can get it on Amazon. Um, I want to just like close by showing you a few other health defense systems. Stem cells, how we regenerate. Every day we regenerate. Your hair grows back, your skin grows back, hair, hair for most people. Um, your gut grows back. If I cut off the tip of uh, your lung, it'll grow back as well. Take away two thirds of your liver, it'll grow right back. Make a cut, it'll grow back. We cannot yet grow back an arm or a leg, all right? But that's what biotech companies are working on. Our body, our, as a health defense, calls stem cells into action after an injury. This is like even showing you after a burn of patients who you know have a have a scalding injury they go to the ER you measure their stem cells it goes up 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 over about 2 weeks then it comes back down after the wound is healed and the more the worse the injury is the worse the injury the more stem cells come out to repair your wounds all right so this is actually hardwired into us as a as a response 
50% of our stem cell activity is lost as we get older and older and older. That's one of the reasons why biotech companies are so interested in stem cell therapy. Uh, can we inject it in the brain to grow back brain? Can we inject it in the heart to grow back heart? Can we inject it into the spinal cord to grow back spinal cord? I'm, I'm not going to, I'm working in all these areas. What I will tell you what I've seen is that while stem cell therapy is not ready for prime time yet, I will tell you that we've seen individual patients do remarkably well when they've actually received these biotech therapeutic stem cells. But what's more amazing is your body can do it itself. There's a whole bunch of these diseases where stem cell ther stem cells are important, okay? Chocolate can actually grow stem cells. So this is where like people are getting into looking at uh, how much uh, uh, ca cacao, hot chocolate, dark chocolate, 80% or higher, high flavanol uh, chocolate, actually mobilize the stem cells in the circulation. These are healthy stem cells, not dangerous stem cells, not cancer stem cells, but they're actually mobilize them up. So even this is, this is a study for men in their 60s who have heart disease, okay? Many men who are the age who have a prostate cancer also have heart disease. Turns out that actually drinking hot chocolate two cups a day, 80% or higher, dark cacao, no added sugar, can actually raise your uh, the number of stem cells in their bloodstream up to twofold, and it improves the circulation as well. Pretty amazing, all right? This is the kind of stuff that I do every single day. It's I, I, like I go to work every day and it's like another jaw dropper we're actually seeing. But my point for you guys is that some stem cells are dangerous. These are cancer stem cells. So when you have surgery and remove, remove cancer and it comes back, all right? If there's no margin, it comes back because of the cancer stem cells. If you have cancer and you're treating with hormonal therapy or chemotherapy or radiation and the cancer comes back, it comes back because of these little baby regenerating stem cells. Cancer cells, remember the copy paste part, when they get copy pasted, uh, some of those stem cells that are cancer stem cells will just grow themselves back. So now in the biotech world, we've been trying to figure out how to actually develop a drug that could kill cancer stem cells. Imagine that breast cancer, prostate cancer, brain cancer after surgery. Is there something we can give? I can tell you it's a holy grail. We do not have any drugs that can kill cancer stem cells, but we have to, because this is exactly what it is. Cancer treatment, some cells survive, and then they come right back. This is really one of the reasons that, um, I mean, for long-term outcomes, we got rid, get rid of these cancer cells. We don't have the drugs, but Mother Nature has already put substances in foods that we have discovered in the lab can kill cancer stem cells from different types of cancers. Purple potatoes have been shown in the lab to kill colon cancer stem cells, chocolate, breast cancer stem cells, Green tea, colon breast cancer, walnuts, colon cancer, um, olive oil, thyme, and capers have, have been extracted and have been shown in the lab to kill prostate cancer stem cells. And by the way, not every, it's not like they tested every stem cell. This is what research is, this is where we are, snapshot and research in time. Maybe the dark chocolate would also work. Maybe the purple potatoes would work. We're not there yet but I'm just giving you a little peek at what the world is looking at in terms of food as medicine and what might be uh, an advantage uh, to being able to actually uh, treat uh, prostate cancer stem cells. If you've been to the Mediterranean, you know, capers are delicious in a salad. Thyme, think about, you know, um, what you put, uh, 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 cook with uh, as an herb. All right, I'm just gonna close now with one kind of big concept, which is the, the food we eat impacts our microbiome and it also, uh, impacts our immune system. And these systems are go hand in hand. Our gut health is connected to our immune system. If we, if we screw up our gut health, our inflammation goes up and our immune system goes down. Do not want to do that. And, and the reason we don't want to do this has now been recognized by the mainstream where uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded in, in 2008 for the discovery of the science leading to cancer immunotherapy, which is coming to prostate cancer, by the way. This is actually from April of this year. CAR-T, which is a type of immunotherapy, is just starting to show some pr promise for treating patients with prostate cancer. This has been, it's an uphill climb. We're not there yet. The pitons are in our rock wall. There's a lot of people working on it, um, but it's actually promising. I wanna share with you now uh, other successes outside of prostate cancer that would give us hope that within the field of prostate cancer, this is one of the ways to go. This is President Jimmy Carter. At the age of 90, he had melanoma that spread to his liver and his brain. Game over. And he withdrew from public life. But he got into a clinical trial for a cancer immunotherapy called a checkpoint uh, therapy. And guess what? This therapy actually was able to 
kick up his own immune system at age 90. And his immune system, remember I told you those cops in the beat taking away the bad guys, basically removed all the tumor in his brain. This is not President Carter, but this is another patient where we've seen a very similar type of effect. You can actually, even in your 90s, activate your immune system. It's powerful enough to wipe out, dry erase, okay, away cancer that's spread into the brain. This is like something I never thought I would see in my career. And now, I'm telling you, this is not just with melanoma, but with any cancer that that has the signatures that they might respond to immunotherapy. This is cholangiocarcinoma, gallbladder cancer, a uniformly deadly cancer. And here's a patient getting a checkpoint inhibitor, kind of the same thing, the similar to what President Carter got. And look at that, look at the big, bright, um, glowing spot in the PET scan on, on the top image. That's a patient with, uh, a, with a cholangiocarcinoma in the liver. And look at this, after giving immunotherapy, wow. The immune patient's own immune system tackled that and made it get smaller. Really amazing that we can actually do this now. And these are pretty safe treatments overall. This just came out in June, a couple of months ago. This was, this was like a marquee title in ASCA, which is the American Society for Clinical Oncology. They found a immunotherapy called dostarlamab that in all 14 patients they treated, the first 14 patients, 100% of them all of their rectal cancers disappeared. I mean, like we, we don't see this kind of stuff. This is how cancer is actually uh, showing. And, and this is the paper from the New England Journal, so credible journal. And, and look, at the, look at the graph on the right. All you need to know is that the, the percent of the tumor just went down, 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 down after getting the treatments. And these pictures, I'm not gonna take the time right now, given the time to show you, but look at the top, that fungating, nasty looking thing in the upper left-hand corner after six months, gone with immunotherapy. This is what we want for all of our cancer patients. It's really remarkable. And the diet makes a difference. We now know if you want to re respond to immunotherapy for this, that dietary fiber is a bit different. How much you feed your gut microbiome. In fact, this is a study from the MD Anderson Cancer Center looking at melanoma patients showing that if you want to make somebody a responder, you got to feed them dietary fiber. This is a study with 128 patients showing that for every five grams of dietary fiber, a patient who's getting immunotherapy ate. Dietary fiber feeds the gut microbiome. Gut microbiome talks to the immune system. Immune system does, does the cop on a beat thing to wipe out the cancer. Correspond to every five grams correspond with a 30% lower risk of cancer progression or death. Pretty jaw-droppingly important. By the way, you want to see what it looks like? What, what the dietary fiber does? When you actually look at raw dietary fiber versus cooked dietary fiber, this is what, what the, in these black pictures, black and white pictures, this is what the bacteria see. I, I showed this uh, at, a, at a cancer conference um, in, in England recently. And you know a lot of the people who are nutritionists like, well, I don't know what it looks like. This is the view from the bacteria, all right? And we now know that the non-immune cells, the bacteria talk to the immune cells through a social network. So this is the Facebook uh, this is mapped out by the Weizmann Institute in Israel. This is the Facebook or the TikTok of actually uh, what's going on between your gut bacteria, your microbiome, and your immune system. Very complicated. We're just still trying to figure it out. And we also know that um, that that uh, there are fruits and vegetables like pomegranate, the Concord grape, and cranberries that can actually make a difference because certain foods like pomegranate um, actually can cause the gut to secrete more mucus that grows a bacteria called Acromantia mucinophila. This Acromantia, what does it do? It actually creates some mucus, the bacteria grow in the mucus, the bacteria that the Acromantia grow, communicates with the immune system, and these immune system actually speak to or respond to the immunotherapy hanging in a bag, and that's actually how the patients benefit. Now, why am I showing you this? And whose bag of, of immunotherapy is that I'm showing you? My mother's. My mother, at the age of 80, 82 years old, had metastatic endometrial stage four cancer, okay, after surgery and radiation, brachytherapy, and it came roaring back, and it was game over, uh, kind of like President Carter. Uh, so I tore a page from his playbook, and we actually found a marker that she would respond to and got her on a checkpoint inhibitor, okay, not yet proven for prostate cancer, but there's lots of research going on, uh, but the whole point is immunotherapy. We only gave her three treatments, no chemotherapy, okay, three infusions, uh, half an hour apiece, uh, every nine weeks, uh, every three weeks apart, so in total of nine weeks, and at the end of that, 
my mom's 80 year old immune system was strong enough to be activated in the manner in which I just showed you. We also gave her pomegranate juice. We also gave her, you know, dietary fiber. And she was a complete responder. To this day, eight years later, she has zero cancer in her body. We've stopped treating her because the immunotherapy, we, we didn't know what we were treating anymore uh, after this. So here's a lot of foods that beneficially affect the microbiome and the immune system. It's in my book. Um, uh, and, and by the way, I'm going to actually give you guys something um, in a moment, uh, you can do a, down, a free download. But where are we going in the future? We're really trying to figure out how do the foods, the flavors that make foods taste good, okay? Because we want people to like foods that are good for them, not to fear foods, but to like them. So there's a whole concept called the flavor room. You've heard of the human genome? Well, here's the food flavor room. And what we're trying to do is to figure out what are the chemicals and natural chemicals from mother nature that makes food taste good? And what are the effects that they have on our body's health defenses, including those cancer pathways? Can we actually connect them? Because then we can have foods that taste good that are also able to help restore our health and help fight cancer. We are a long ways away from prescribing foods for prostate cancer or any other type of cancer. But what I hope I've shown you is just how powerful um, uh, some of the foods are. So we're catching up to the pharmacy, pharmaceutical world, but it's going hand in hand and we're learning a lot from biopharmaceuticals that actually can help us inform it. Here's the difference, okay? When you go to the oncologist's office or the clinic to get your treatment, that is the kind of healthcare that the healthcare system is actually able to give to you. But when you're at home, all right, that is a different kind of health care because you're caring for yourself by activating your own health defenses. So by the way, um, I tried to figure out uh, if I could make it easy for you guys without pounding you with a list. If you take your phone and put, hold it to this QR code and take a picture of it, it'll take or, or just go to it, you'll actually get to a free download that I'm providing to you of a list of foods that activate all five of those body health defense systems, angiogenesis, stem cells, mic microbiome, immune system, and DNA protection. I, I just wanted to be able to give you guys a, a, a start on a list. There's many more um, actually in my book. Um, and I'll just close because uh, I'm sure that you've got plenty of questions with this quote from Albert St. Georgie, the Nobel Prize winner, physiologist. He said, discovery consists of seeing what everybody's seen, but thinking what nobody has thought. And I hope what I've shared with you today gives you uh, more uh, insight into what those of us who are studying food as medicine are kind of probing into now, but also maybe give, makes you think a little bit more carefully about the choices that you actually make uh, when it comes to what you actually serve yourself um, as your own medicine three times a day at home. Thank you very much. Dr. Lee, that was fantastic. Holy cow. Um, I want you to do a Netflix TV series that comes on like every week so we can see something like this every week from you. This was phenomenal. I mean, the information was incredible. Uh, the educational value is immeasurable. And I personally, as a prostate cancer patient, appreciated your uh, deep diving into some of the prostate-specific foods and medicines, but also the wide angle on how my body is addressing my overall health, but also how it can impact, you know, all those five defense systems that you talked about can impact my prostate. So I want to thank you very, very, very much for an incredible presentation. Oh my gosh. Um, I'll just speak for myself, but in all the years of research that I've done, um, this is one of the best encapsulated research presentations I've ever attended in my life. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you for the and opportunity. You know, Thank you. I want to open this up to questions now, and um, I'm going to turn it to one of our uh, question monitors. Um, Jeff, do you have a question from the audience? Yes, I do. I have a question from Bill. He says, doctor, will store-bought tomato sauce suffice, or do we need to prepare at home to get good nutritional benefit? So this has actually been studied when it comes to lycopene which is really the, the bioactive that we're talking about because that's the lycopene has actually been measured in the blood of men with prostate cancer uh, and healthy men with healthy prostates as well. And so that, so we, we do know that that's actually an important substance. It turns out that um, canned and uh, canned tomatoes also have lycopene. Turns out when you get the tomato paste, you know, that comes in tubes, you can order it online or you see it in the grocery store in the middle aisles. 
look, they used to, they used to say, stay away from the middle aisles. I'm telling you that, that canned tomatoes and tomato paste um, actually contains lycopene. And in fact, sometimes you'll see in the, the, the paste double concentrated or even triple concentrated. Guess what mm. that, in addition to the flavor of the tomato, guess what it also concentrates? It concentrates a lycopene as well. So you don't have to cook it at home. In fact, it's probably a lot easier uh, to get it in a can or in a paste. One other thing about um, uh, uh, a tomato, uh, cooked tomatoes, most people don't know this, but <clears throat> tomato juice is usually um, cooked. So when you actually go and buy, you know, pre-made tomato juice, um, it's already kind of tomato has been boiled and cooked and there's like a pain in that too. The only thing I would caution on a tomato beverage is to make sure you look at the ingredients to make sure they haven't added all kinds of other preservatives and synthetics, added sugars and other, other things that you don't want to have in there. Wow. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, did you have any other questions from somebody in the audience? Yes. Um, if you don't mind my own, uh, doctor, can you tell me if your germline, uh, your inherited genetics affects your food uptake and which does this play into your, your expertise as you're advising us? Uh, you know, that's an area that is being actively researched right now. I know that there's a lot of these commercial kits you can go out there to see, you know, like, uh, you know, do your DNA test and see what the right nutrition is for you. All I will tell you is I think it's, that's not really ready for prime time. We, we're not fully cognizant on that. I just, I'm writing my next book right now. Um, uh, uh, so anybody who wants to hear about what I'm doing next, which is on metabolism and it will connect to cancer, um, you know, come to my website and I'll be posting things on that and social media about the progress that I'm making on it. But what was really amazing to me They've actually looked at germ lines of, of healthy people to and, and, and looking at metabolism to figure out why certain people might be wanting to eat certain foods. And they did find, and this was the most convincing thing I found, they found a chromosomal uh, marker that actually made people want to eat more orange carrots. Hmm. I, I don't know. I can't, I don't know what to make of that. Um, uh, they were interested in studying diabetes and carotenoids and things that are in carrots but I do know that there's promise in this area. So I, I don't have a direct you know, answer to you about um, any particular person's germline and prostate cancer, but I will tell you that there are secrets that we need to unearth in the, in the germline. Thank you. Wow, terrific. That's fascinating. Um, do you wanna tell everybody your story about carrots and how they became orange? I heard you mention that in one presentation. I thought it was fascinating. <laughs> oh, right. Well, you know, listen, one of the fun things about food is uh, that I enjoy doing is to um, like uh, to learn a little bit about the history. And as I was doing research on carrots, by the way, I, I did an angiogenesis research uh, project looking at carrots. So that using that same ring assay. OK, and we were looking at um, carrot. And then I talked to a big food company that does carrots, uh, you know, the people that make Jolly Green Giant stuff. And I basically said, like, um, the farmer said, you know, that, that from a sustainability perspective, one of the things they got to do is they, they kind of take off the carrot tops before they send them to the market and they use it to refertilize their, their beds. Okay. They put it in a compost heap. When I talked to the big food companies, they're like, yeah, that's a big pollution problem because we got to pay millions, tens of millions of dollars to get rid of the, the garbage. Uh, you know, like, so you buy a bag of frozen carrots, what happens to the tops? They, it's pollution for them. Right. And so I, took that as an idea. And I said, why don't we study carrots for, to see if they're anti-androgenic, which they are. So I'm just giving you the spoiler alert right now. Carrots are anti-androgenic. Um, but then I wanted to study the carrot tops too, because what if you can actually do something useful with the trash? And what we found was amazing that carrot bottoms are anti-androgenic, but carrot tops are twice <laughs> out of anti-androgenesis. Oh and in fact, um, so if you actually save the carrot tops, what could you do it from a from a cooking perspective? So we, um, I'm going to get to the orange part in a second. But um, so we actually uh, found if you talk to some um, village uh, nonas in Italy, what they do with carrot tops in the villages, they make them into pesto. Oh, so you can wow. actually, you know, wash them really well and then just grind them up in a pesto. And, and it's an incredible way to actually light up your, your diet with more anti androgenic stuff. Why are carrots orange? Turns out that carrots originally came from uh, Asia. 
uh, uh, as Western Asia, and they were not orange. They were purple with a yellow interior. Now, if you go to some farmer's markets, you can find these heirloom carrots that are kind of weird looking. They're purple on the outside. Break them open, they'll be bright yellow on the inside. That's how it was back in, you know, thousands of years ago. And carrots wound up actually coming over from Asia, from China, over to Europe, all right, through the Silk Road. It was a big trading route and eventually made their way to the Netherlands. And um, the Netherlands, the, 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 Dan the, ne the Dutch farmers bred the carrots to be all orange in recognition and celebration of William the Orange, who was a Dutch activist that freed the uh, Netherlands from the Spanish rule. And they wanted right. to celebrate this hero. <laughs> I love that story, but, uh, but I liked what you, the, the setup that, that about the carrot tops. I'm now gonna look at carrot tops entirely differently now from now on. Um, Martin, you're also a question monitor. Did you have a question from the audience? Well, um, one of our first question is, uh, Dr. Lee, do you recommend uh, quality, and excuse my pronunciation because I haven't heard of this, uh, sulforaphane supplement to achieve proper concentration that's difficult to obtain from cruciferous vegetables? All right, let me kind of explain that question uh, to everyone so that they understand. Remember, I, so basically, um, sulforaphanes are the natural bioactives, natural chemicals that are found in cruciferous vegetables. Cruciferous vegetables are the broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, kale, okay? And you remember that um, research paper I showed you, the slide I showed you early on in presentation that showed that those men who actually ate more cruciferous vegetables had less risk of actually having progression of the prostate cancer. So that's, I think, where this question is coming from. And the and the sulforaphanes are actually found in cruciferous vegetables. And, you know, there are supplement companies that actually have try to figure out how to um, get the sulforaphanes out and then put them into a capsule. So the question to me that I'm hearing you ask, uh, Martin, is that, you know, do I, what do I think about supplements and is that a good way to actually get those sulforaphanes? Um, here's what I, here's my answer. Um, it's always the better, it's always better to get your bioactives, including sulforaphanes from whole foods. Um, you can, even though the supplements can have them. Why? because whole foods not only have the bioactives, but they also have a lot of other good stuff like dietary fiber that you'd find in broccoli and other cruciferous vegetables and Brussels sprouts that feed your gut microbiome, that talk to your immune system. You don't get that in a dietary supplement. So isolating everything as if it were a drug and packing into a powder can be useful, but I call a supplement a top off. If you really, for some reason, can't eat um, a, a, a vegetable, a cruciferous vegetable, you know, you might want to kind of consider a dietary supplement, but I have not yet seen sufficient research comparing whole foods versus dietary supplements when it comes to the sulforaphanes to be able to recommend the sulforaphane over the food. Great. Thank you for that answer. Martin, did you have another question from the audience? So I think you may have covered this. This is uh, from someone in our audience. Uh, you may have covered this in your presentation, but um, what meats, if any, are better for the prostate than the others, or are meats just completely bad for the prostate? All right. So the way that I can try to frame that question, sometimes it's helpful for me to reframe the question in a way that, that will resonate with everyone, and I'll tie it back to my presentation. So what I showed you uh, in the last hour are, is the research showing the kinds of foods that activate your body's health defenses including those defenses like the immune system, the microbiome, androgenesis that can stave off cancer. So those are hardwired health defenses. Almost all the foods I showed you um, were uh, plant-based foods, fruits, vegetables, legumes, uh, healthy oils, that kind of stuff, all right? And, and by and large, that's where all the healthy stuff comes from. Um, I have not seen much evidence that meat actually can activate your health defenses. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Most of the research shows that meat is either neutral or can damage your health defenses, causing more inflammation, damaging your microbiome, sparking angiogenesis because of some substance in the meat. And, you know, so, so the question that always comes back to me like, well, so Dr. Lee, are you a vegan? All right. I'm not a vegan. I'm actually an omnivore. I, I actually like to eat very diversely. I, I enjoy 
food. I don't enjoy eating. I don't stuff my face, but I really enjoy um, the, the connection between culture and food. And I love great flavors. So here's what I would tell you. If you spend most of your time eating foods that happen to be plant-based um, and uh, you know, I've given you lists of all them that actually activate your health defenses, you know, your body is probably going to be able to withstand some of some meat every now and then, even red meat. That's not that great for you. Uh, that can that can take down your health defenses a bit because by and large your most your shields are mostly up, okay. Uh, that that's what I would actually say. Is there a particular meat that's actually less damaging? I mean, now we're starting to split hairs. You know, is 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 pork better than chicken? Better than beef? And what cut of beef? You know, it's an interesting question. Um, uh, I will also say in a in a category of of animal protein that I didn't get a chance to show you this, but seafood is actually, uh, uh, the, the meat from seafoods actually seem to have bioactives that are also helpful for your health defenses. Uh, I was reviewing a study the other day that kind of made my eyes pop open that sea bass, Chilean sea bass, Branzino, actually has a, um, a peptide, a protein isolated from the meat and isolated from the skin that actually causes better wound healing. So it actually ac activates your blood health defenses. I haven't seen too much about what actually fights prostate cancer, although I will tell you, putting on my biotech hat, there are a number of drugs being discovered from sea creatures now, or chemicals being discovered from sea creatures that are in development, including for prostate cancer. Wow, thank you. That's a great answer. Uh, Martin um, or Jeff, did either of you or any of the other question monitors uh, pull up another question from the audience? I do, I do very quickly, a gentleman here that looks like he really needs some good advice. Sorry, Phil, but this gentleman asked me, Andrew LaFoe says, I have re I had largely plant-based diet, but recently diagnosed with a stage four Gleason 9. So food may not protect. Does that mean that diet won't help me now that the cancer is in my system? All right, without giving medical advice, let me sort of say that Broadly speaking, uh, um, food and diet is only one component of your body's ability to resist disease and cancer specifically. And there's a lot of other factors that are at play. And I would try to bring it back to the kind of scenario that you just described, which is someone who's done all the right things and still actually has aggressive cancer. So um, we know that diet is one part of, uh, helps activate your health defenses. We also know that exercise, regular physical activity, you don't have to work out in the gym, you don't need a trainer, but regular physical activity um, allows your body's health defenses to rear themselves up and uh, form good shields. We also know that, um, uh, that uh, sleep is really important for helping you regenerate and re uh, your, making your immune system uh, fortified and helps you rebuild your health defenses while you're sleeping. And also to purify a lot of toxins. Did you know that when you sleep, um, uh, when you get a good night's sleep, we're talking about dreaming sleep, which a lot of us don't regularly get, all right? There is an entire sewer system in your brain called the glymphatic channels that open up. They're shut during the day. At night, they open up. They're like the sewers of Paris, okay? And they drain 60% of the toxins that have accumulated during the day out of your brain. You don't get good sleep. Actually, those toxins accumulate the next day. Now, what do those toxins do? And this brings me to the next point, which is that they help to raise your stress levels. Your stress levels go up, your catecholamine levels go up. It sparks tumors and inflammation to get angiogenesis going. And so again, food, you know, eat, sleep, move, smile, lower stress, stay physically active, get good sleep, eat the right foods. All right, those are all parts of actually handling the non-pharmaceutical side of of a disease like, like cancers, including prostate cancer. Now, what about that? What about the person who actually you know, says, I've been doing all the right things, eating all the right foods, and yet I still have um, uh, developed cancer of whatever form? I would say, don't just uh, food, you know, first of all, if you didn't eat those healthy foods, your cancer might be even worse, number one. Number two is that what about those other aspects of your life? If you go back and really do a careful audit of how well you sleep, how much stress you have, how physically active you are, that may actually account for it as well. And this is, by the way, what we're discovering from people who, you know, like you, you, we all know someone like this, or we've heard about someone like this. 
young, fit, 40-year-old marathon runner who, who eats right, exercises, who drops dead of a heart attack uh, while, while in, in the middle of a race. Like, what's up with that? You know, does that mean that we shouldn't be exercising anymore? No, it just means that that individual, you know, basically some, some part of their machinery kind of wasn't quite working the properly. Sometimes hard to know what are those factors. But what I would tell you is that if you actually are dealing with cancer, now's the time to double down on dietary, um, getting your diet good, okay? And by the way, even even you know plant-based, uh, I will tell you, um, there's a lot of things that are plant-based. Oreos are plant-based, okay? Fake meats are plant-based, but they're all ultra-processed foods. So be very, very careful when you think about plant-based. There, I would say eat more like people in villages of Italy, where, you know, if you've ever been to Italy, it's a pleasure, you know, having a meal there. Okay, rather than going to the salad bar at Olive Garden, I would say, take a look at how people are actually eating simply, or in a village in Japan or China, go back to basics. And I think that's the best way to kind of try to figure out how to right size your diet. But don't forget, exercise, sleep and stress management. Wow. Um, we have a couple more questions, but we're going to answer them offline and after the meeting. We want to respect your time and the, the time of all the attendees. Dr. Lee, um, I know I'm speaking on behalf of everybody that attended. Wow, we are blown away with your level of knowledge, your level of skill, your level of awareness, all the different systems. You're a very unique person because you've got the medical background and the nutritional background fully enmeshed together. Um, I certainly recommend everybody to read your book. I, it's it's phenomenal, Eat to Beat Disease. It's just chock full of good information that, you know, I feel healthy just reading it because I know I'm going to incorporate some of those things. Again, I want to thank you. I want to let everybody know we're, uh, we're going to wrap up the meeting and we want to thank Dr. Lee. All we want to do is tell you that, first of all, don't forget, if you want more information about Dr. Lee or get on his newsletter, go to drwilliamlee.com. And to uh, get on the ASPE newsletter and to, uh, if you felt this was valuable, maybe you wanna make a donation to ASPE, go to aspatients.org to find out how to make a donation and to find out about future events. We have one coming up on genetics uh, at the end of August. So everybody, we're wrapping up. We wanna thank you for attending, but most of all, we wanna thank Dr. Lee for your phenomenal contribution to humanity and for your specific contribution to us today. Thank you so very much.